and welcome to the 12th lecture in the history of Rome. We have now surveyed the rise of Roman power on mainland Italy. We have set the stage for the expansion of Rome in the East Mediterranean by looking at the international scene as it looked uh, around 270 or so BC. It's now time to turn our attention to the actual expansion of Rome in the Mediterranean, a rapid and remarkable event in the history of the world, noted by contemporaries, which we will first of all outline in the next few lectures and then eventually try to seek explanations for uh, at a later lecture. Rome's rise to dominance can broadly be divided into two halves. First of all, dealing with the western Mediterranean and specifically the city of Carthage. And then in the second half, in the second phase, uh, turning its attention to the highly developed Hellenist, um, Hellenistic half of the eastern Mediterranean uh, in the period in the be beginning around 200 BC or so. So if Rome's conflict with Carthage starts in 264, the first 60 years really re seeing Rome concentrating on the western Mediterranean uh, and then the subsequent 60 years seeing Rome concentrating on the eastern Mediterranean it falls quite nicely into two chronological phases. First of all, however, we will deal with Carthage. We will outline the nature of the Carthaginian state, examine how it was that Rome and Carthage first came into conflict, outline the course of the war, and then discuss the ramifications for both Rome and Carthage of this, the First Punic War. Carthage, by tradition, was founded in 814 BC by the Phoenicians, although archaeology reveals nothing earlier than the mid-8th century at the site, so that date is open to question. It was, found, it was founded by Phoenician traders uh, whom the Romans called Puni, and hence the name of these wars is the Punic Wars. The Romans called the, 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 uh, the Carthaginians Phoenicians, Puni, in their language all the time, and so that's why we speak about the Punic Wars, not the Carthaginian Wars. It was located on a magnificent harbour, highly recommended as a place to visit. If you ever get a chance to visit North Africa, I can recommend Tunisia highly. Carthage is located on a superb natural harbour with a fertile hinterland. And when we add into the mix an enterprising population, uh, such as the Phoenicians, then the city was quickly to rise to some position of influence in the Western Mediterranean. By the 6th century BC, the Carthaginians already had established trading posts all along the coast of North Africa towards the Atlantic Ocean, as well as on uh, Sicily, Sardinia, uh, Corsica and Spain. Their traditional enemies in the region were the Greek colonies of Sicily, particularly Syracuse, and the Carthaginians and the Syracusans and some other Greek states there fought a long series of wars for control of the island, which were still unresolved uh, in the 3rd century BC. A sort of balance of power in Sicily, however, pertained by this date with the Carthaginians, broadly speaking, in control of the western half of the island and the Greeks, especially Syracuse, in control of the eastern half of the island of Sicily. Carthage maintained her overseas interests through a mixture of diplomacy backed by a large naval capacity and mercenary armies. This was because Carthage was run predominantly by mercantile, by mercantile families and mercantile interests and had a shape in terms of its government, so far as we can make it out, that is quite analogous to the Roman Republic. There was an oligarchy of um, leading families grouped together in a sort of a Senate-like council. This had evolved, it appears, from an earlier form of, of autocracy, when a, when a king-like figure called a governor had been in control. So rather like the Roman Republic, the Carthaginians appear to have moved from monarchy to a sort of uh, oligarchic system of government. But these uh, ruling families had a Senate-like council, and they had every year two leading magistrates, who, the, who they called shafets, uh, sufites in Latin, who were sort of like the consuls. There was also a popular assembly of adult male citizens, the function of which remains obscure to us. But a very unusual feature of the Carthaginian state was a permanent standing court of 104 lifetime members. 
whose job it was to scrutinize the activity of public officials uh, and generals who were hired or sent out on a Carthaginian business. Uh, rather like Darth Vader, the Carthaginians did not take well to failure by their underlings, and it was quite common for them to crucify generals or admirals who failed in their tasks, especially if they were deemed by this court to have been negligent in any way, or worse, if they had been taking bribes or something. So quite tough taskmasters, um, and the uh, officials kept in play, kept on their toes by this 104 lifetime member court of officials. Carthaginian motivation was driven by merchant-like interests of profit and cost effectiveness. This is what really uh, drove, stimulated the Carthaginians in all of their actions. And this differed considerably from uh, Roman stimuli, from Roman motivations. Carthage, in some ways, was run like a large company. I, I often describe it to my students as Carthage Inc. Uh, they are interested in using their navy, but only to back up their trade interests. Um, it seems that every year the profits of the state were totted up and shared out among the citizens. It's almost like shareholders. Uh, that's rather a crude, it's, it's rather a crude analogy, but nonetheless there's some truth to it. They would resort to war when it was necessary, but if they could find a peaceful solution through diplomacy or threats, they would prefer to do that. War, after all, was costly, uh, and that's the last thing that the Carthaginians uh, wanted to face, was a costly endeavour. In contrast, the Romans were motivated more by socio-political concer concerns. Uh, they were concerned to maintain loyalty with their allies. They were concerned to uh, maintain face in the face of their allies. Cost-effectiveness was not something that featured heavily uh, in the Roman motivation and agenda. So it was then that in the middle of the 3rd century BC, these two states, one the land-bound land state of Rome, the other the mercantile uh, naval-based state of Carthage, faced each other now in close proximity, especially across the Straits of Messina between um, Sicily and mainland Italy, where the Romans were in control. And the, the, the way that they came into conflict, these two great states came into conflict, is almost ludicrous, uh, it, 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 and it was indirect. It's worth looking at this um, cause of the war in some detail just to see, just to, as an illustration of how historical contingency from apparently minor incidents can lead to, in fact, titanic and um, serious consequences. It seems that ar around 288 or 289 BC, a group of Italian adventurers from the area of Campania, who call themselves the Sons of Mars, Mamertines, they call themselves the Mamertines, were in the employ of one of the rulers of Syracuse. When this ruler died, they found themselves out of work and began marching uh, up the eastern coast of Sicily to make their way home to southern Italy. When they reached the town of Messana, which is in the very northeastern corner of Sicily, across the straits from Regium uh, on the mainland of Italy, they changed their plan. They liked the look of this place. This was a Greek city-state, and the uh, local rulers of Messana took them in as guests, put them up in their houses, uh, and generally treated them very well. In repayment, the Mamertines, on an agreed-upon night, cut the throats of their hosts, uh, robbed all their possessions and their wives, and seized control of the town of Messana. For the next 20 or so years, they took advantage of the Syracusan and Carthaginian conflicts on Sicily to carve out for themselves a sort of brigand kingdom in the northeastern corner of Sicily. They even had the temerity to issue coinage as if they were a, a real and legitimate state. Uh, so they, they obviously had high aspirations for themselves, even if they were to overlook their rather ignominious origins. But as the Greeks uh, increasingly looked like coming out on top in the conflict with Carthage over Sicily, the position of the Mamertines in Messana grew increasingly more perilous. Eventually, they began to fear that the Syracusans would attack them and punish them, since most of their victims in forming their brigand kingdom had been Greeks. So, they appealed 
to a nearby Carthaginian fleet and commander for assistance in 266 BC. The Carthaginian naval commander brought his ships into the harbour at Messana and took Messana under the protection of Carthage. The Syracusans who were threatening the Mamertines decided that it was not getting, that it wasn't worth fighting a full-scale war against Carthage over these desperados in Messana and backed off. And that would really have been that if it hadn't been for a strange decision on the part of the Mamertines. For whatever reason, we wish we knew why, they felt uncomfortable under the Carthaginian protection. And they appealed across the Straits of Messana to a Roman garrison on the mainland at the town of Regium. They appealed for assistance. They used as the basis of their appeal the fact that they were Italian mainlanders, they were it, you know, Italians like you Romans, that they worship the same gods, unlike those foreign Carthaginians who worship their own gods. Here we are, the sons of Mars. Mars, after all, was the ancestral deity of the Roman people. Remember, he was supposed to be the father of Romulus. So they made all these emotional appeals to the, to the Romans, who, after a heated debate in the Senate, decided to accept Messana under the Mamertines into the friendship of the Roman people. The technical term is fides, into the... Um, uh, faith, loyalty, uh, area of influence of the Roman people. This was a momentous decision. It didn't seem like so at the time, but it was, in fact, a momentous decision. Because the Romans then moved a small garrison over to Messana, and the Mamertines uh, and the Romans combined forced the Carthaginian commander to withdraw. You can imagine the reception he received when he returned to Carthage. Having been judged to have behaved stupidly, he was crucified. But the Syracusans still wanted to exact their vengeance on the Mamertines, and now they actually allied with their former enemies, the Carthaginians, to attack the Mamertines in Messana. But remember now, the Messanans are under the control, or at least under the protection, of the Romans. And this is how, indirectly, when the Syracusan and Carthaginian force attacked the Messanans, the Romans felt themselves obligated to defend their new friends. And as a result, Roman and, and Punic forces came into conflict over, really, people who were, to all intents and purposes, gangsters. Quite ludicrous. The, the conflict started in 264 BC, and it's not my intention to go over the, the details of this war and all its, all its various aspects, but we will outline its course, dividing it into three main phases. We will also pause on occasion to look at illustrative events that show us the nature of the war, the enormous efforts that were expended on both sides in its prosecution, uh, and to draw out some of the dramatic nature of this huge struggle between Carthage and Rome that lasted from 264 to 241 BC, the First Punic War. The first phase of the war, the first four years from 264 to 260, were fought on land in Sicily. Uh, this is where the Carthaginians had traditionally uh, um, always done their fighting in the uh, area of Italy. And the Romans, of course, had been drawn into Sicilian affairs via the Mamertines at Messana. And so the first battles took place uh, on land over Sicily. Whatever the reason, by the way, for the start of the war, whatever about the Mamertines and, and the beginning of the war, once the war started, they were forgotten. Now it quickly evolved into a struggle between Carthage and Rome for control of Sicily. So the original war aims were forgotten. If it was trying to restore the Mamertines and save them, forget that. They vanished from history. Now it's fighting for control of Sicily. Another typical feature of wars, they often escalate in their, in their goals uh, once they've started. <coughs> Anyhow, uh, the salient uh, event in this particular phase of the war is the capture by storm um, uh, by the Romans of the uh, uh, fortified town of Agrigentum in the south coast of Sicily. I've been to this place, it's a very, very formidable uh, fortified location, quite remarkable to think that the Romans could have taken it by assault, by direct frontal assault, but they did in 262, drove out the Carthaginians who were there, and this was such a terrifying event for the, for, for the Carthaginians that they, for the rest of the war, they avoided any direct open battle with the legions as a result of this, of this event. They figured that the Romans were, if they could do that, that they were not going to be easy people to beat on the field. <coughs> 
However, despite having defeated the Carthaginians on land, the Romans quickly realized that uh, they were going to have to develop some form of naval capacity if they were to actually win the war, since Carthage could simply resupply their forces in Sicily by sea. The Romans at this stage uh, were not a major naval power, as we saw at the end of the last lecture. So, in 260 BC, they built a massive fleet from scratch. Uh, the story goes that they built it on the model of a captured Carthaginian warship. There's reason to doubt that. That, that particular story, since we have seen that the Romans did have a form of coastal defence uh, prior to the Punic Wars, but it does make for a good story, sort of, sort of the first example of an arms race, uh, military secrets, how to build a, 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 a seafaring naval warship, we'll capture a Carthaginian ship and copy it, um, but that story might well be untrue. But once the Romans had built their fleet, uh, we, we enter the second phase of the war, stretches from 260 to 255 BC, and sees the Romans... Remarkably, in their first naval engagement, the first major naval engagement, emerging victorious. This is the Battle of Mili off the coast of Sicily in 260 BC. They did this primarily by developing a technology that allowed them to transfer their land-based superiority onto the seas. They, they developed a mechanism called the raven, the corvus, which is essentially a large bridge on a swivel that has a spike at the far end of it. And whereas the traditional form of warfare was to ram enemy ships and sink them, uh, the Romans would draw up alongside the enemy ship, drop this bridge across, the spike would then impale itself in the enemy's vessel, in the deck of the enemy's vessel, tying the two ships together, and then the Romans would send their marines over, basically tr uh, transforming the ships into platforms for land-style warfare uh, um, in which the Romans had the advantage. So confident were the Romans now that they got carried away with themselves and sent an invasion force into Africa uh, in an attempt to uh, attack Carthage directly. This invasion force left in 256 BC and in 255 it was completely annihilated when it was ambushed uh, in, in, in a um, uh, valley um, near Carthage. This year also saw an enormous reversal of Roman fortunes in a most silly fashion, the Romans, despite the fact that they had um, uh, built their navy and were um, developing themselves as a naval power, were not really accustomed to matters, matters maritime. And they had uh, left their large fleet exposed on the um, western side of Sicily when a three-day storm struck. And they lost 77% of their fleet to a storm. Now, to get an idea of the scale of that catastrophe, when the Japanese Imperial Navy attacked the U.S. Uh, um, Navy harbored at Pearl Harbor in, for, in 1941, the, uh, the U.S. Navy lost 3% of its entire fleet, 26% of its war fleet. And that was considered to be an appalling catastrophe. In this storm, not even enemy action, the Romans lost 77% of their war fleet. This would have been enough uh, for most states to have considered negotiating a peace, but in typical Roman fashion, they just knuckled down, and within three months, they had rebuilt their fleet. The final phase of the war stretches from this rebuilding of the Roman fleet in 255 to 241 BC, and is illustrative of the difference between Roman and Carthaginian motivations. The Carthaginians, once again, focused their attentions on Sicily, they decided to conduct guerrilla-style operations against Roman interests in Sicily and fortified some naval bases and some land bases and sent out raiding ships and land-based raiding parties to harry Roman lines of communication and Roman supply lines. This particular uh, system of warfare seemed to be going very well for the Carthaginians and they were finding the, the maintenance of their navy a somewhat burdensome affair. Remember, cost-effectiveness is one of their chief forms of motivation. Maintaining a large navy that isn't really being used was uh, um, really quite uh, expensive. And so as a result, they decided that they would uh, demobilize uh, large sections of their navy. Between 248 and 242 BC, while the uh, land forces on um, Sicily are harrying the Roman lines of communication, the Carthaginians demobilize, they disperse much of their, much of their name, main naval force. In the same period, the Romans built 200 new ships 
So the longer the war dragged on then, the greater was the advantage given to the Romans. They were the ones who were interested in prevailing, in securing political and military dominance over areas uh, of, of, of territory. The Carthaginians were interested in counting the shekels. How much is this costing us? And the longer the war dragged on, the, the, the less cost-effective the war was from the Carthaginian perspective. By the time the Carthaginians had realized that the Romans were now well-equipped with a new navy, it was too late. They cobbled together as best they could a naval force and sent it out to, to, to try and tackle the new Roman, uh, the new Roman fleet. The, the two fleets met at the Aegates Islands on the western seaboard of Sicily, just off the western seaboards of Sicily, and the Romans crushed the Carthaginian fleet. The Carthaginians were forced to surrender. This then was the first uh, major overseas war that the Romans embarked upon. Its course, which we've just outlined, as you can see, was an epic one involving uh, major defeats and successes for both sides, the, the, the fortunes of the war shifting to and fro. But what shines through again and again from reading about this struggle, and we'll be seeing it repeatedly uh, as we look at Roman expansion across the rest of the Mediterranean, is the Roman sense of determination, their dogged, dogged stubbornness to prevail in the face of sometimes overwhelming odds. Uh, um, catastrophes that would have caused other states to consider perhaps negotiating a peace merely caused the Romans to knuckle down and work harder to, to redouble their efforts. With the Carthaginians humiliated and defeated, the Romans imposed a vast war indemnity uh, on the Carthaginian state. They hit them where uh, it would hurt most in their money purses. They levied an indemnity of 3,200 talents of silver. One talent would have made uh, any individual a millionaire in the ancient world, and here was a uh, war indemnity of 3,200 talents. Carthage was also forced to cede all its interests in Sicily to Rome, which, uh, um, who now adopted Sicily as uh, its first overseas province. 241, Sicily becomes the first province of the Roman people. The Syracusans, who had wisely decided to side with Rome when, when, when push came to shove, were allowed to exist uh, as an ally of the Roman people. But the rest of Sicily uh, became a province, the first overseas province, of the Roman Empire. In the years following the, um, the First Punic War, the Carthaginians got involved in a very silly conflict in their homeland with their own army. Uh, the Carthaginians were not a citizen-based militia like the Romans in typical Carthaginian fashion. They hired their armies, they hired mercenary armies, and since they had lost the war against Rome, they found themselves unable to pay their mercenary armies. Uh, which were parked outside the city and ended up having to fight them. Uh, they, 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 they actually had to fight their own troops. So this was a great period of, of turmoil for the Carthaginian um, uh, state. And the Romans took full advantage of the Carthaginians being so wrapped up in fighting their, their own mercenary army. And in 238 BC, they seized Corsica and Sardinia and annexed those two islands also as provinces of Rome. So by 238 BC then, the Romans had uh, extended their power outside of Italy. Uh, they were now um, in control of Sicily, and they were now in control of Sardinia and Corsica. The First Punic War had major ramifications for both Rome uh, and for Carthage. In the first place, the Romans had been drawn out of the Italian peninsula for the first time. Whereas before now, they had focused all their attentions on gaining ascendancy over the peoples of the mainland of Italy. Now, for the first time, they found themselves in control of territories outside of, of the mainland of the Italian peninsula. Secondly, and through circumstances uh, forced on them by fighting the First Punic War, the Romans now found themselves in command of the largest navy, not just a navy, but the largest navy, in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, in repeated battles, they had proven themselves to be 
successful in using this navy, even if they had shown their greenness from time to time, especially by exposing their fleet to a three-day storm, uh, which was to uh, destroy it in 255. That's just a sign of their um, um, neophyte nature in matters naval. But uh, by the end of the Punic War, of the First Punic War, they were fairly adept at naval matters and now possessed the largest fleet in the Mediterranean. It was with this fleet, of course, that uh, they were able to annex the islands of Sardinia and Corsica in 238 BC. And above all, the Punic War shows us, as far as the Romans are concerned, shows us their attitude towards conflict. They will continue to fight for as long as they can. This would have been impossible for the Romans to do were it not for their confederation of Italy, as we've examined already. Were it not for the enormous resources of manpower that they could draw upon to send armies into Sicily, to send armies across to Africa, to build, man uh, a fleet, all of that was uh, founded in the success of Rome in organizing the Italian mainland uh, in their confederacy. Their, ap their sheer doggedness to fight on, really a cardinal feature of Roman imperialist policy. For the Carthaginians, the uh, defeat at the hands of the Romans was humiliating to be sure, but it also had some very important ramifications. They were debarred now from their traditional sphere of influence in the Tyrrhenian Sea. Sicily now belonged to the Romans. Roman fleets patrolled the seas between Sicily and Sardinia and Corsica. This is where we have seen the Carthaginians were traditionally most interested uh, in this area of the sea. Now they were effectively shut out from uh, any operations, trading or otherwise, in that, in that area of the Mediterranean. So they looked westward. Between 241 and 220 BC, under a leading Carthaginian family called the Barcas, they carved out for themselves a small empire in southeastern Spain. This they did, again, with, largely with mercenary armies and with naval support from their, from their fleets, which hadn't been annihilated by the Romans, but had been limited by them and defeated by them. But they were still able to supply an army in Spain, which over the course of the next 20 or so years carved out quite a profitable uh, um, empire for themselves in Spain. Plenty of natural resources in Spain to explo uh, exploit, gold mines, silver mines, lots of natural resources, and of course, uh, uh, very effective fighting troops in the form of Celtic troops, whom the Carthaginians began to take under their wing, uh, train and form into a formidable uh, fighting force. So between 241 then and 240 BC, uh, sorry, uh, 241 BC, the end of the First Punic War, and about 220 BC, the Carthaginians, especially under the family of the Barcids, the Barca family are active in Spain. A final ramification of the First Punic War uh, exists on a rather personal level, and I'll end this uh, lecture with a small anecdote that reveals it. And that is the, that in certain quarters, uh, the defeat by um, Rome was considered by certain Carthaginians to be a very bitter pill to swallow them indeed. They really resented it. They especially resented Rome's seizing of uh, Sardinia and Corsica when the Carthaginians' backs were turned, basically trying to fight their own mercenary troops. The story goes that one Carthaginian general, a man called Hamilcar Barca, one of the, a member of the family um, who was busy in Spain, when he was about to set off uh, for his command in Spain to help uh, extend Carthaginian interest there, was, as one would do uh, in the ancient pagan world, as you're about to embark on a, on a new endeavor, sacrificing to the Carthaginian gods. Hamilcar had a son. The son was at that stage only about nine or ten years of age. The son desperately wanted to, wanted to join his daddy uh, on the new adventures in Spain. His father said, if you want to come with me, you must come up to the altar and take an oath with me uh, to, our, to our ancestral gods. Hamilcar brought his son up to the altar and forced him to swear on the ancestral gods of the Carthaginians that he would never be a friend of the Roman people. Hamilcar's son was named Hannibal, and he was to be one of the greatest banes in Roman history. In fact, 
He was to lead the, the Carthaginians to great glory in Spain, but to even further glory in Italy, when in the next lecture we'll see he invaded Italy in the course of the Second Punic War that's also quite rightfully called the Hannibalic War. That is the focus of our next lecture.